today is Zheng Yu Kao from UC Berkeley who will speak about operator growth and hydrodynamics. Yeah, so I enjoyed uh, a huge diversity of uh, intriguing talks, and uh, um, in the final talk of today, I would like to um, actually I would like to talk about um, two different subjects. Um, the first one is really appetizer. I want to keep it short. It it, it it's not in the ad uh, announcement. That I I finally uh, uh, would like to uh, include a sh short section on this because I s I see that, uh, uh, that there is a uh, there is extended crowd um, interested in you know, 1D systems and entanglement and, 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 and in particular in integrable systems so on and so forth. So I think I guess this can be interesting. And, uh, and the second part is uh, a more extensive part, uh, which is which is announced on operator growth scales and hydrodynamics. So um, the first part uh, is uh, based on uh, work uh, in this paper. Um, Done with uh, Antoine Tiloa and uh, Andrea De Luca, and uh, um, the setup is is it, really it's really, um, it, really a, a step, a little step beyond uh, a closed closed quantum systems, uh, isolated uh, evolution. Uh, it's, it's it's kind of an open quantum system. So, but we start with the really the the, the simplest uh, setting possible. So so. Um, Let's start with the free fermion chain, 1D free fermion chain. Uh, it's, 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 much, it's more trivial than all the integrable system we, we have seen. Um, then to make, the, to, make, to make it more interesting, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, it's completely in the wrong uh, order. <laughs> to make it more interesting, I want, I want not only the unitary evolution, uh, but also some continuous measurements. So I, I, I do not want to enter into the detail of this line of equation, but you should think of it as, uh, as, 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 as the following. So your fermions are hopping on this, uh, on this lattice, but the, the occupation number of each site is being, is being continuously monitored. So what does it mean to be continuously monitored? In, in quantum mechanics 101, we all learned a, a projective measurement. So you, you measure the, whether there's a fermion here, then there are two outcomes, whether there's a fermion there, there's there's no, and the, the state is projected. Okay, but this is a bit too brutal for us. We want to do something more, uh, more, more continuous. So what you can do is you can send some probes uh, to interact with this fermion, to to couple with some this fermion, and then you 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 projectively measure the probe, because the probe and the fermion is a, is, a, is is has been has been coupled. When you measure the probe, you also you also project partially your system. And uh, it is well understood that this process can be can be can be modeled in some kind of in a kind of a random uh, a stochastic in a stochastic Schrodinger equation in, uh, in, uh, in this form, where where the number gamma is the measurement rate. So how how much how, how much probes you you send and measure per per second measure uh, to 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 each to each fermion. So um, if you are familiar with the open quantum systems. Actually, um, if you if you look at the density matrix and the uh, average over it, you will see that time evolution uh, uh, satisfies the so-called Lindblad equation. So you have this unitary part, and uh, you have this so-called uh, uh, dephasing part. But actually, uh, this equation is uh, is uh, is a uh, is, is, is a further level. It it allows you look at it, it allows you to look at the, this this individual state that that forms this uh, that form this uh, uh, this this ensemble of Described by Lindblad equation, so why do we why don't we study Lindblad equation and study and uh, this more uh, this uh, more more uh, complicated looking equation? Well, there are several advantages. For first reason is that this this Lindblad equation with with these Hamiltonian and with the, these occupation number operators has been studied. It has been well very well understood. So I 
I, I, will, I, will, I will talk about this later. Um, moreover, this, uh, this system is, uh, has, has two main advantages. The first one is that actually this evolution is Gaussian. So if you start with a Gaussian state, you stay, uh, the, the, state, the state will stay Gaussian. So you can do quite easily numerics, uh, numerical sim simulations of large systems. It's like simulating a free fermion chain. Ba basically, you just have some randomness there. And also, and also um, the state is pure. You can see that there's, uh, unlike, unlike this Lindeblad equation, which is the, which is the average version, here, here there's a, uh, the state is random, but it is pure all the time. So then you can define its entanglement entropy um, in, in, the, in the standard way. In contrast, if you want to uh, in, uh, define entanglement entropy for a mixed state, then you have to, you have to work harder and you have to, have to pick one in, in definition. Uh, among, among several in the literature. So the goal here, as the title has already indicated, uh, is, is we want to study the entanglement of, of, this, of this random state under this evolution. So what, 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 does, what does the evolution, what does the terms do? Um, okay, the free from unitary, you are all familiar with it. If you start with some uh, um, um, low entanglement state, generically it, uh, it will it will generate an uh, entanglement, uh, and, and the system will reach finally a a, uh, a volume low entanglement state. Now, this continuous measurement, what it will do, and you, you can you can again get information from uh, from projective measurement. If you projective measure, for example, half of the spins, then these half of the spins are just become just get projected, and uh, and uh, you will kill entanglement because these spins will will at least be decoupled from the rest of the system. So, so, so in terms of entanglement, these two these two terms are doing different things. So it, it's interesting to look at uh, how they how they compete against each other uh, as a function of this gamma, of, of this uh, measurement rate. Okay, so what is our method um, to do this? It's 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 a generalized uh, hydrodynamics. So first of all, this Linda this Lindblad equation allows to write down an exact uh, GHD equation. Uh, and uh, this this was already known, although in some other forms by people like Snidarik uh, and and, and Prozen in, um, in uh, a few a few years ago. So so basically, what you have is that you so you you you, you can you can you can write down this uh, density uh, um, of of quasi particles and it's just uh, nothing but the weakness distribution. So there is a free fermion path. So the pa quasi particles just move freely, and then there is a defacing defacing term um, due to the Due to the defacing, due to due to the continuous measurement, so what 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 does it do? It it basically just uh, just uh, hits a hits a uh, quasi particle and it changes its uh, its uh, its momentum randomly to it picks just a new momentum uh, 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 randomly from from minus pi to pi uh, in a uniform fashion. So a picture is a picture of a quasi particle under this GHD is just uh, this uh, quasi line. So so you just move and then from time to time. Um, this time is exponentially distributed. That you get hit by the by the defacing term, and you change your velocity, you change your uh, momentum, and this velocity is just some cosine k of, of free fermion. So now what we do on top of that is that we we kind of marry this uh, this GHD, uh, which actually does not tell us about the uh, entanglement, uh, with with this uh, with, with the uh, quite well developed theory of entanglement of, of free fermion of, of free fermion I think it starts 10 years ago and now and, and, and now there, uh, there's there's work uh, to uh, of generalization to, to interacting um, integrable systems and uh, what we what we um, propose in th on top of that is that uh, the measurement actually uh, collapses and uh, recreates entangled uh, entangled aquatic particle pairs so each time you have a each time you have a um, you have a measurement, you have you uh, when when the free fermion when when a quasi particle gets um, gets measured get gets uh, gets scattered by the defacing term, it actually there is there is actually a, a creation of quasi particle and uh, um, and this is this quasi particle pair is uh, is entangled and and the entanglement entropy is just generated by these pairs and uh, upon the next uh, measurement event, this pair will be will get co collapsed. So using, um, I'm not going to into, into detail how to make this qu quantitative, but we can make it quantitative, and we can we can propose a approximate quantitative theory for entanglement of this system. So what does that tell us? 
Well, uh, the main prediction is that any slight amount of, of, conti of continuous measurement on the whole system, if, you, if it applied uh, to the whole system, will kill the volume law in, uh, entanglement and, uh, and it reduces the entanglement to an area law. So, so in particular, um, if you look at the, the average the entanglement, ang uh, entanglement, uh, entanglement entropy um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a subsystem on a subinterval of, of length L, then at at large time and uh, and if the if L is also large, you get you get just some constant which you can compute exactly um, over over the measurement rate. So it does increase it does increase this, uh, to to infinity as as you turn 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 off the measurement as you can expect from the free fermion limit. But at any at any um, finite amount of measurement, you will get you won't get something which is proportional to to uh, to L, which is which would be volume law, so it's always area law. And if L is finite, uh, then then actually we can predict a uh, a, a sca scaling form. Um, so so this this entanglement uh, per L scales with with L times gamma with the exactly computed uh, scaling uh, scaling function, and uh, we can compare it uh, with the numerics, and uh, um, and it works well. Uh, Across across uh, uh, several orders of uh, of uh, strength of measurement. So a remark: um, this destruction of a volume law, we think, is specific to uh, to to free to free non-interacting models. Actually, there uh, there there is a there there are there are um, several papers after after our work that 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 mm, that, that, that 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 are focused on uh, uh, the case of uh, strongly interacting chaotic models. And uh, and uh, th there has been there has been a period of uh, contradicting conclusions, and uh, now I think it, it 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 it's getting settled down to the to to the consensus that actually if you have an interacting model, then you then uh, you can have volume law even even the model gets continuously measured. Yeah, it's the same kind of measurement. It's a, li a little bit different. So they they are they are considering projective measurement but applied on dilute set of. Uh, of, of, of sites. I guess the physics should be the same, although they don't claim results on continuous measurement. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, then we can do, you know, we have a GHD theory, so we can do something more fancy. For example, we, we, <laughs> we can look at uh, this uh, uh, domain wall initial condition. So we, we set two uh, densities on the left and on the right, and we let the system evolve. So if you look at the particle density, it does something like this. So, so actually, the, the transport will become diffusive at long time because you, your part, particles are not conserved, but they, they, get, they, they, they get scattered. This is a particle density picture, and we can, we, can, we, can also we can test it, and it works very well from GHD. But then, um, furthermore, the GHD seems to work also uh, when you look at the entanglement entropy across, across this half system cut. Um, it works well for this, uh, for this, uh, for this density setting uh, one half, uh, two, uh, one, one third, and two third, and uh, more surprisingly, it also works qualitatively okay for this case uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, hard domain wall with, uh, with with fully filled uh, left and uh, and no fermion on on the right. Why is this? Why is that surprising? Because our our theory does not our theory does not. Um, Account for this logarithmic uh, in entanglement in this uh, in this measure in this measure less case, so so you see so so you see that there there, there is some uh, discrepancy between between the between the uh, prediction and the and, and, and the numerics, but but nevertheless it's it it, it seem it, it seems to be giving a, a qualitatively good answer. So okay, to to wrap this part up. So we, we have proposed the approximate uh, quantitative theory of uh, free fermion entanglement dynamics with uh, with uh, with continuous measurement, and the main message, main technical message is that if um, there is no volume law, and uh, you can understand the reason by saying that uh, the quasi-particle pairs gets uh, get collapsed um, continuously, so they have finite uh, lifetime, so you cannot they cannot support uh, 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 vo volume law uh, vo volume law entanglement. So, uh, ongoing or future work is it's, it's an in interesting question of what happens uh, if you have an integrable uh, interacting system instead of instead of a free system. Well, will the volume law survive? 
and and this this we don't know yet, and uh, uh, we're trying to figure out how what happened. Yeah. So I will first take questions on this part before moving on. Yeah. Okay. Very, very initially, the the motivation is to is to look at the. Uh, um, uh, so-called entanglement of fluctuation. So there you have a. Okay, so it's not working. Uh, no. Yeah. So I don't know if you, uh, if you if you are familiar with this work in um, in random unitary circuits. So there there is this uh, uh, body of work in um, random unitary circuits that so it. They are also random unitary evolutions, and uh, there the entanglement is uh, the random object, and they 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 found that its it, its its statistics is KPZ, it's in the KPZ universality class. So that was great, and we we thought, what what if we come up with something more physical? Because that random unitary model is is kind of a a theorist toy model for for random unitary evolution. So this is what we came up, and uh, that's. That that uh, that that did not work. There's no KPZ in, in there. <laughs> this was the original hope, but uh, but instead of finding KPZ, we find we find a, we find a, a, a GHD um, a theory. So that's it. Uh, yeah, it's it's it, it must be specific to that. And for example, if you measure if you measure total number of spin, total number of something, then then you will not. So this measurement is, is special because at each time you measure it, you you project partially the the qubit and then you disentangle a bit the system. So that that creates a competition with the uh, with the unitary evolution, which tends to generate entanglement. So then then the question becomes non-trivial whether you whether entanglement is survived or not. In, in, in some in, in other gen more general ca cases, then both terms will tend to generate entanglement. And I, I, I think you will always have volume or entanglement in that case. Yeah, OK. So uh, let me go on to the second part. So this part is on operator growth. And uh, it's, it's, um, it's in this paper, and uh, it's done. Um, with the Berkeley team, so Daniel Parker is a, is, a, is a PhD student. Thomas Gaffidi is a postdoc, and he's moving to Toronto uh, for a uh, for a faculty job. And uh, Ehud is a, is a uh, is PI uh, in this group. Um, so, so really, I, I I would like to motivate this uh, this this part because it's, it it seems unrelated to the topic of of hydrodynamics. Um, <laughs> Let alone uh, generalized hydrodynamics, I should say that the hydrodynamics in my talk is not generalized, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so really, I want to motivate this by by comparing a mi a microscopic approach to to a many-body quantum problem in, uh, with the hydrodynamic approach. So uh, from microscopics, you you have a Hamiltonian, let's say a one-D Hamiltonian um, um, transition invariant, and uh, then the starting point of hydrodynamics is some conserved quantity. Let's say Q is conserved. It's a, it's a sum of some con local conserved charges. Okay, then what do you do? Then you write a, you write a continuity equation. J, J is the current. Now this step, I, th I, I, I put the arrow here, but you could also put the arrow here, arrow here because, because Q and J are both operators, and you can, you can write exactly what Q and J are in terms of, in terms of microscopics. Now the next step is is non-trivial. If if you if you manage to uh, write the average density, a average current in as a functional of average density and uh, its derivatives and etc., then you plug this back in and you get your hydrodynamics. This is very th this is this is this is this is a huge success, but but this is very difficult, and we can do this in some in some in some in some specific models, but not in or in, in generic model. Now. If you cannot do this, then what you can do? Okay, hopeless, hopeless uh, attempt is to say, okay, I have this equation, so 
I don't know what is J. So let me write an equation for J. So uh, the, 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 the time derivative of J is something is some other operator, and, the, and then I don't know what, it, what, this, what this looks like, and so, go and, and go so on and so forth. So I will generate an infinite hierarchy. So <laughs> okay, this, this, this teaches me nothing, you will say. However, you, can you, you see already that I have, I have here uh, O2, O3, O4, and you can imagine that these operators are, are, more, and more, are more and more complex, and uh, this, this is what I mean by, by operator growth. So I, let me put this um, in a more precise setting. So, so the, the time evolution of an, of an operator is given by a Heisenberg equation like this, so, so the, the current is really something given by the commutator of edge of O, and then, okay, you want to know what this is, so it's, 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 time, it's time evolution is given by the nested commutator and so on and so forth. So, of course, you can, you can combine all these equations into one equation, which is, a, which is a Heisenberg picture of time evolution. And uh, this is what people call operator growth. They, so they, they, really, they really want to start with a simple operator, for example, a local term or a, a, a sum of local terms. For example, you have, you have, you have a density wave of, of your conserved quantity. And, you, and so this is O of t equal to zero, and you want to look at uh, what o, o of t um, looks like. So let's, let's just think about this, this uh, one-dimensional model for, for a second. Um, you have your favorite spin chain, so you have your O of t over zero at, uh, at, some, at some point, it's a local operator. Um, then, what will, then what will happen is that this operator will become uh, more and more non-local. Okay, so in this quantum in this quantum case, when we think about this world complex, we we, we think about uh, we think about the uh, non-locality. And by the way, this 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 non-locality is is um, constrained by the so-called Lieb Robinson bound. If you have a if you have a, a short-range interacting system. Now we can, it, it helps. It will help in uh, for 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 the later slides to th also think about this, this operator growth in a classical system. So you can do the same thing in a classical system just by replacing the, the commutator with the Poisson bracket. And the, this operator in a classical system is just a function on the phase space. So here I, 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 I plotted a function on, the on this two-dimensional fixture phase space as a, as, as, uh, by a color plot. And uh, this is t equal to zero. And then as, as, uh, as, as evolution, uh, under, under time evolution, this function will become more and more Fractal, I would say the, the the different the different parts get tears apart. Get they, yeah, they they are moved apart by by the Liouville dynamics to to different places, um, and uh, here uh, w complex would mean fractal. But we will if you if you know something about the like butterfly effect and the chaotic system, you, you will see you will you will realize exactly that this complexity is is just nothing but the classical chaos. Okay, so just just to recap, the operator growth is really <laughs> the slogan that operator become operators become complex in in um, um, under under unitary evolution, and uh, what you can also say that uh, the nested commutator uh, with the Hamiltonian of a simple com operator becomes complex because this is what it this is what enters into the right hand side of the equation. So of course this is very vague. So you would you would say, so can we quantify this growing operator complexity in a more precise way? And if we can, if we can give some numbers, um, does operator growth follow some universality? Can we say something general? We have seen that in classical systems, there is some, there is, there must be some relation with chaos. So is this relation general? Can we, can the, can the, can the quantity of operator complexity be related to chaos? And uh, I hope that I hope that I can come to point D. So if we learn something from A to C, can we apply this back uh, to to hydrodynamics? Okay, uh, question so far? Good. Yeah, so since we are studying operators instead of states, I just want to make life easier by, by introducing some notation. So I will treat operators as states, so uh, I will put a, a round bracket. And then I will, I will write the commutator with the Hamiltonian just by 
just by Leuvillian. So the Leuvillian is a, is a, is a example of a so-called super operator. It's just a, a short, short hand. And then we, we have to put a in inner product on the operator space. So here, um, I, will put a, I will put an infinite temperature inner product, which is just a trace of two, two operators, uh, A dagger B. For, for, simplicity, for simplicity, I, I, can, uh, I can comment on final temperature if I have time. So, so now we, we would like to see quantities that, quanti that, that, that quantify uh, uh, um, um, the growing complexity of O of T. So the natural place to look at that we, uh, is, is from the linear response quantities. For example, this autocorrelation function and, uh, and, uh, and its Fourier transform, which is, a, which is a special function. So we will see later that you can, you can find such quantities um, in with other physical origins, but here we want to, we want to stick with uh, uh, quantities of linear response. So then um, I claim that this, uh, this complexity of, of the operator is encoded in the high frequency tail of the spectral function, while the hydrodynamics is rather encoded in the low frequency um, part of the of the spectral function. So uh, we must ask why, and I have to I have to explain it. And in order to explain it, uh, I want to introduce uh, a a third a, a third uh, way of uh, of encoding this. This, this, this piece of data, so you have this Fourier transform um, uh, relating these two, and then if you Taylor expand this uh, this function at zero, or if you look at uh, if you look at uh, if you look at this these kind of integrals, uh, you will find these positive numbers which are which are called the moments, and uh, they are nothing but uh, the norm of the nested com of nested commutator. So we are saying that they become they become more and more complex. So the first, the, the, the most naive way to measure how they become complex is, to, is just to calculate their norms. And also you can see that this formula uh, tell, tells you that the, the, mom the moments for, for large n uh, will depend on how the, how the function of phi of omega behaves at a large omega. So this, this justifies why, uh, why, it's, uh, why, why the complexity is a high, is a high frequency um, quantity. So yeah. As I said, ha, ha, faster moment growth at large n means faster complexity growth. So we now we ask uh, how fast is fast. It turns out that these moments are not really are not really convenient to to measure uh, to 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 measure things to say how things are fast. So there there's a, there's a yet another way to encode this information, and uh, uh, it is the following. So instead of looking at the Norm of this nested uh, uh, commutator of, of 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 O, uh, we take this series and we apply a so-called Gram-Schmidt uh, orthogonalization. So basically, you want to find a series of uh, of operators um, such that they span the same thing, but they they are they are orthonormal. So it's it's, it's so-called QR decomposition. Then it turns out that this Liouvillian is a tridiagonal under this uh, Kredov basis. So this is nothing new. This is something called the, the uh, Lanshaw's algorithm or Kredov subspace method. And depending on de depending on where um, where you where you learned it. So if you have this basis, then the Lanshaw th then 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 this Liouvillian is the tridiagonal matrix under this matrix. So so uh, L of O M just just it can just help to. For example, L of O three is just something O two plus something O four. And this has been realized uh, in physics in, uh, um, in 1981 by Matisse, and he was very, he was very excited, excited that he said that, okay, we reduced everything <laughs> in physics to a 1D quantum mechanics problem. <laughs> of course, of course, of course the, the subtle thing is that you have to be able to compute these Lanshaw coefficients. If you know all of them, then, then, you, know, then you, know, mm, you know a lot. So, what what do these Lanshaw coefficients tell us about uh, about the growth of operator? So, which is also the growth of moments. Actually, if you if you have this representation of your of your Liouvillian as a as a matrix, then it's really easy to compute this. For example, mu two is just a, it's 
it's just the B1 square. So you basically take this matrix, raise it to some power, and then compute its matrix element uh, over here. So then you can write down, for example, mu2, mu2 is just B1 square, mu4 is B1 square, B2 square, plus something else. And in, in general, mu2n is B1 square multiplied through to Bn squared plus, plus some other terms. And uh, for the purpose of our talk, we, you can, you can you can you can you can think that this this term is a is 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 a dominating term. Up to up to some corrections which we, which will be not um, important for this talk. So so, all in all, the length, the growth of Lanchard's coefficients is also a, it's a different just another different way of of, of quantifying uh, the growth of moments and, and the way of quantifying how complex the operator becomes. So the good thing about this this mapping to one D. So I, I actually spoiled this. I said it's, it's a reduction to 1D quantum mechanics problem. So here it is. So remember that the, this this Lanchard's um, this this Liouvillian it becomes tridiagonal. So so it, it's a it's a tridiagonal mix. It's, it's really just a hopping problem on a semi-infinite chain. So the bases are just uh, o, o 0 o 1 o 2 o 3 o 4 and the hopping elements are B and are the Lanchard coefficients. So so you can you can really you can really write your operator O of t. As a wave function on this uh, on this 1D chain, and this wave function will satisfy a discrete Schrodinger equation, just just some just some hopping, and the initial condition is O t equal to O zero, and the O zero is here. So the initial condition is the delta peak here, and then what will happen in general is that you you will uh, the wave function will just spread to uh, to to the right. Yeah, so it will spread to the right. And uh, this this equation will appear later. Um, in particular, if you look at so if so the origin so the origin the the amplitude on the origin will will will, will in general decay. And uh, this is nothing but uh, this uh, autocorrelation function. So so we we we, take, we 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 took a whole tour and we are back to autocorrelation function. So okay, so here here, here it is. Um, we start from here, and this is related to the spectral function, and uh, we take we. We came here. Uh, these are the moments, and then we say to compute them. Uh, there's a there's there's an equivalent way to encode them. It's they, they are called the Lanchard's coefficients. So they, they they turn out to be the most computable uh, um, numbers. So, and uh, finally, we will see that there is also another quantity called the Green function. So this is related to, for example, the correlated by Laplace transform. So all these four quantities are just the very familiar linear response quantities. They they are related to each other. By linear transforms, and they encode exactly the same information. Now, this one is a bit special because it is related to these four by a nonlinear transform. So we have seen this formula between u2 and d, and they are nonlinear. And also, there is a very elegant formula relating this green function to the Lanchard's coefficients. It's called continuous fraction expansion. It, it, it's, it's well known, and it's like uh, 19th century mathematics, but it's just very elegant. And we will see how we can use them for hydro after that. So, so the, the, the summary is that we started from here and here and we started from these quantities and we see that we see that these these Lanchard's coefficients encode the same encode the same information and, and uh, they are asymptotics um, tell us how uh, how moments grow and thus how um, uh, how the how the operator complexity grows. So let's look at how Lanchard's coefficients grow in different kind of models. So this is what we did, and um, <coughs> over the last few months, and uh, and we found a striking empirical pattern. Depending on the type of the system, of the dynamics of the Hamiltonian, you have different asymptotics of the Lanchard coefficients. In a free fermion model or any non-interacting model, you the the Lanchard coefficient will stay bounded or constant. In a in an um, interacting integrable model, here there's a bon there's a um, there there's this quite tricky example where you have excess which is not really interacting, but then you then you then you put in not a uh, you put in a string operator, so it bec so it becomes not bounded a bit, but but it becomes a square root growth. And uh, we also found the square root growth uh, uh, numerically for a truly interacting integrable model, uh, the Heisenberg chain. And finally, if you look at the chaotic model, like the uh, Sashdev-Yekitaev model, um, 
you will find a linear growth. So, so this is this 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 is this is the the universal hypothesis uh, operator growth hypothesis that we put forward. That, uh, that is the asymptotics of the Lanchard coefficient depends on the type of dynamics. So you have you have bounded for free models in, uh, and square root for integral models and chaotic for 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 uh, uh, linear for for chaotic models. So I should say that this this part is really well understood. We we can explain why. People people knew this before. Um, this part is not really well understood, and I I will not spend a lot of time during the bulk of the talk. I will comment on the, um, in the end, and we will focus on this chaotic uh, this chaotic part. Yeah. Yeah, you will see it's in the chaotic uh, case. You will see. Basis. Uh, ah, it's basis. It's basis independent. So this whole process is basis independent. Yeah. yeah. It depends on the starting operator. Depending depends on the uh, Hamiltonian and depends on the norm, which is here just uh, the trace. That's all. Yeah. yeah. I saw another question. Okay. Good. Yeah. So. We we see we we have seen this pentagon. Everything is connected. So let let me let me just rephrase this hypothesis in terms of a special function. Maybe it it sounds more um, sounds more familiar to you. So if you have a chaotic system, then we expect that the special function decays uh, exponentially at high frequency. And actually, if you you can even relate the decay rate with the growth rate of of the Lanchard coefficient um, quite uh, quite precisely. Now, uh, on, on the other hand, if you have a free system, then um, then then the special function has a has a bounded uh, has a bounded support, and uh, uh, in between there is this integrable case where the special function is believed to decay as a Gaussian. So special function. So this 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 slide is useful because uh, we have seen to talk from th this morning that um, about the ETH. So I sh I let me comment that the special function uh, is. By this Lehman representation, special representation is nothing. It, it, it's it's really telling us something about um, the the op diagonal elements uh, of of this of this uh, operator in uh, in the basis of in the energy basis. So it's 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 telling us how how the you know, how the matrix elements uh, uh, all elements fall off uh, as as the energy di and the energy difference uh, increases. And it's it's it and the special function relation, the special function formulation also makes this uh, um, makes makes it uh, in principle possible to to, to measure um, uh, how, how 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 these things grow by for example uh, periodically driving with this operator and see how how fast the uh, how fast the the system heat heats up and then that requires finite temperature so it's so it's a bit beyond the scope of the current talk okay never mind um, so let me show some more empirical data for uh, 1d spin chains so um, yeah um, we tested uh, with uh, with uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, a couple, uh, maybe a dozen of uh, of of, of uh, chaotic spin chains, mainly some kind of uh, chaotic Ising model and, and such things. And uh, and here, so you you have you have the SYK model, uh, such that yeah, key dive model, which is a kind of all to all model, is kind of cheating, <laughs> but you see a, a perfect linear growth, and you you have you have you have uh, you have, uh, you have um, e even an analytical formula. Of linear growth, and then for for one D models, we have to do some uh, so-called uh, some num exact numerics. So every point you see is is exact, but then if you want to go further, it will cost exponentially much. So we stopped there, and uh, you see we see we see that this linear growth pattern is, is quite uh, is quite robust, and uh, you can o you can even amuse yourself by turning on a small interaction from a from a non-interacting Ising model. So this is the Ising model and then you turn down a little bit of inter interaction and you see that as 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 long as you turn off a little bit of it, uh, it, it, it it starts it starts to grow and, and uh, then uh, as in some in some strong interacting limit it, it becomes really perfectly linear. Uh, it's infinite system. So you can so this kind of operator algebra you can you can do it in infinite system because the operator has finite support, so it doesn't care about uh, what happens. 
Yeah, this free fermion is this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you are right. So this was uh, so before you see, you saw this. So th there is this bounded. So if you have free fermion, for example, x x, if you have x y model, uh, then this is for example z. And if you start with uh, x, which is a chain, which is a string, you get a, you get a square root growth. Yeah, it's like an integral model. Yeah. Right, so now after presenting some empirical evidence, I want to say something a bit more rigorous, uh, although we haven't proved uh, this hypothesis. Um, the, the rigorous thing we can show is, that's quite simple to show, is that this linear growth is an upper bound for local systems. So indeed, you can, you can show that this, this product of Lanchard's coefficients uh, it's really, it's really just, uh, it's, 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 I think it's small, smaller or equal than, than the norm of, uh, of this operator. And, uh, and this operator, and this operator, you can show that, uh, this norm, you can show that it's smaller than the, than, than the, sub, than the, uh, than the product of the support of, uh, of, of L of K. So why? Because you, you apply, you apply the Liouvillian um, repeatedly, and uh, each time the Liouvillian, the Liouvillian, the Liouvillian is the uh, sum of local terms. And it can hit. It can hit at different positions. And uh, the larger your operator is at the previous step, the, the more positions the Liouville can hit. So this is why this this is this is how this counting argument comes from. So so the picture is that you, your your as as n increases, you have you have you have larger and larger um, um, support support size. But this support size is really is really hard 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 constrained by um, by the locality of your interaction. And the in free system, it never grows because if you have quadratic uh, operating it stays quadratic. So, th so then, so then you can you can you you can bound this by uh, by some some something proportional to k. So it becomes uh, n factorial, and then you, you see that this linear grow you cannot the b n cannot grow faster than linearly. Yeah. So so really the message here is that the operator grow as fast as. Uh, it the, the linear growth is the, is the fastest, and uh, we, we see empirical evidence that uh, in a chaotic system, operator grows as fast as possible. So since this is <laughs> low-dimensional conference, I, sh I should say that the low dimension is always a, uh, a source of surprise, and also in this, in this story, so actually what I said earlier is not precisely true for 1D systems. <laughs> And it's really it's it's really a huge surprise. In one E system, actually, you can you can have a sharper bound. The bound the bound is not really uh, the upper bound is not really linear, but the, but the n over log n. So so I really apologize if you if you believe that these these plots I'm sh I'm showing you are linear, you are wrong. They they have to they have to bend a little bit, but we cannot see it because we because to see a log correction, you have to have se uh, several decades. So 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 th there's a th there there's a strong geometrical constraint. That the operator in a, in one D it can only grow at the two extremities. So, so because of this, because of this, you can th there is actually a, there was actually a theorem in the sixties proven by Araki and pointed us to us by by a student in, at Berkeley, uh, Alexandra Adrovsky, um, Adwolf, Adwolfsky, um that there is this theorem and the, and the B N actually only can grow with with uh, like n over log n. However, um, the same group of mathematicians, um, um, in particular Gabriel Bush, proved that if you have higher than two, higher or equal than two dimensions, then he found examples where he can sh he can exhibit linear growth uh, rigorously. So we know that this this is only a problem at one dimension. Uh, however, we say that it is upper bound, but there's no there's not we know of no models at one D that that actually achieve this uh, this growth. So. So this this one D is, is a kind of difficult uh, situation. Yeah. So maybe we should we should just put one D aside and uh, recap the the message for this part. Operator operators grow as fast as possible in chaotic system subject to locality, and uh, uh, Lanchard's coefficients are just uh, are just reflecting this um, this 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 observation.
Oh, about uh, this uh, coil, about uh, this linear rate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Th this is a very important question. So, in general, you know that this this is of order of a of a of a bandwidth. Well, we have no. You are right. We have no method of of saying something more precise about it. But then you can then in the next session I will say something um, precise if you know what this value is. It can be this value is very important. We it's quite unfortunate that we cannot say anything about it now, but we can say something, we can relate it to something else, as you, as you see in the, next, uh, as you, in the next part. So to just spoil it, I will relate that to, to, the, to the chaotic Lyapunov exponent. exponent. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, yeah. So I, I will come to that, and uh, we can discuss. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I know what paper it is. <laughs> um, yeah. So to relate that to to, to classical and quantum chaos, um, let me let us go back uh, to this one D quantum mechanics picture that we that we all already seen. And okay, this is a Schrodinger equation, and, 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 and your wave function spreads to the right, and the we have seen this, this formula. The formula says that the, the, uh, the average position, the expectation value position operator will grow in general as, 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 as a function of time. So we are interested in how, how, how fast it can grow. So to, to find out this, let's just uh, do the, m the crudest thing possible, although we have some exact solutions supporting this. So you take the continuum limit, it becomes a kind of Dirac, uh, Dirac equation. And then you can solve this one, one uh, order one PD, and you can solve this line. You can solve this, and uh, you find uh, you find uh, you find this solution. And in particular, if if V n grows as um, uh, linearly, then you find that uh, this position grows exponentially. Yeah. So this is what I just said. If you have linear growth of V n, then you have exponential growth of the of the position. And uh, by the way, this is an exact solution. So th there's there's some particular kind of VN where you can solve this model, this 1D QN model analytically, and you can, you, can, you can plot them. And in 1D, it's, yeah, it's different. It's, it's not exponential, but it's stretched exponential. Now, if you have anything which that is, uh, that is uh, um, slower than linear, like, uh, like a square root, uh, other power laws, then you will have, then you will have uh, a power law growth instead of exponential growth. So it seems that exponential growth is really, it's really special uh, to, to, to linear growth. And so, how do we interpret it? So, let me let me recall. So, okay, I spoil it. This interpretation of, of this nt growing growing exponentially is the irreversible and uh, and exponential growth of uh, of of the uh, operator complexity in chaotic systems. So we have talking about that. We wanted to quantify this. So here it is. Um, how, at least there is one there, there's there's this quantity. So why? Why why do I why do I why do I call this position on the chain uh, a a, a a quantification of uh, of complexity? Well, let's recall that this basis element on this chain is uh, they are they are just a gram schmidt of uh, of these nested commutators, and we know that these nested commutators becomes more and more complex as n grow. So we expect that the, they so 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 are they? So we, so on this chain you have uh, you. This chain is basically sorting your operators in, uh, by complexity. This is the least uh, complex operator, the starting one, and then it becomes more and more complex. So now, now if your operate, if your O of t is a linear combination on this on this chain, okay, how how would you measure its complexity? You would you would measure it by looking at its mean position. And also, it's 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 useful to think of this chain as kind of a compression of of this picture of operators. You have one simple operator and grow into a huge sum, a huge linear combination of, of complex operators. Yeah, so, so we have seen that we can really justify this, this the exponential growth as the exponential growth of some, of some, of some operator complexity. Um, so we have also, we know also that um, there's also some exponential growth in, in a classical chaotic system, in this butterfly effect. So indeed, you can, if you if you think about uh, if you if you look at uh, 
uh, how the how some quantity at time t depends on its uh, depending depend depends on uh, is affected by some initial perturbation. You will see that this quantity is exponentially growing, and uh, and uh, uh, you can write it as a Poisson bracket. Um, and this this exponent governing this called uh, is called the uh, uh, Lyapunov exponent. And this this is a very no well known story for classical chaotic systems. Now, um, er, as early as Larkin, but later um, in, the, in in the recent years by Mandel, Schenker, Schenker, and Stanford, and and many other people, um, people this the generalization of this quantity into the quantum region just I mean just a quite naive generalization by by replacing the the Poisson bracket by a uh, by, uh, by by uh, by by a true uh, commutator and uh, and uh, uh, replacing this norm by uh, this absolute value square by some norm it has been studied very extensively and uh, under the name of out of time order correlation or, or OTOC in brief. Oh, what's happening? I don't have so so many slides. There are many extra slides. Don't don't worry. Five minutes? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I have auto that grows exponentially in some cases, but not in all cases. Um, and I have k complexity that grows in all chaotic models. And uh, actually, they can be compared. And uh, and uh, the 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 result of the comparison is that there's a bound. So the 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 co the, com the the coefficient alpha is actually a bound on the on on the on the Lyapunov exponent, and uh, this we can we can derive it. So, but I will skip the derivation. So the derivation, okay, I will not skip. It's, it's quite it's quite interesting. So the derivation is really that you 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 know that these operators are are being more and more complex. So you can you can see that O zero is really simple, so its OTOC is small, and O one is a little bit more complex, so you can still bound it its OTOC, it, and so on and so forth. So. So you, you have this you have these bounds. Now, if you know this and you know that O of T is a is a wave on the linear combination of some of some stuff, uh, um, of, of 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 these of these operators centered on N, then you know something about the OTOC of OT. So that that's the idea. It's 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 actually quite simple. So then you can you can bound N of T, you can you can establish N of T as larger than the OTOC of O of T. And then, because that is exponentially growing, and this is exponentially growing, you assume it, and then uh, you compare the two exponents, and that's it. Okay, I'll skip the remarks. Yeah, so um, last uh, few minutes. So we learned that there is some universality in this uh, in this coefficients, and we we can use them to compute uh, to, to compute uh, uh, diffusive transport uh, uh, diffus uh, diffusion constants, and this is really down in a standard way, you, you prepare some prepare some operator with a density wave and then look at its decay, and that is the that that exponential decay should go like a, like in a diffusive way, and that's the pole the decay of the pole of a green function. You want to find that, so you want to compute the green function. So the, n now the green function we have seen is elegant uh, uh, um, continuous fraction expansion. So actually, there's a well-known technique that uses this, this coefficients to calculate the, the green function. And what they do is that they compute the first n of them, big n of them, exactly, and then they stick this with uh, with some asymptotic uh, extrapolation. And we know one, we know one uh, uh, extrapolation, which is from which, which is from the linear growth, and we can compute. This is, there's an analytical no, no example, and we can stick the two parts together, and uh, then and then we can apply this to some um, non um, some non non integrable chaotic model. Um, and uh, it's and you can find the pose of of, uh, of diffusion of, of of green function um, by fitting by fitting first the Lanchard's coefficients and then do that do that uh, extrapolation procedure described and it, it it's it, it, it we are comparing it with some completely independent met numerical method and it, it seems to be quite good and it's quite surprising because we 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 have seen that in one d this, this this is wrong and there is a log correction but. It, it seems that if 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 it's uh, linear enough, it's then then it doesn't in the discrete cases it doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so yeah, I, by skipping many slides, I've done <laughs> all of this. So I will take questions now, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Can you comment on finite temperature? Yeah, sure. You had some slides on, on the bound, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So in finite temperature, what you have is you should choose a different inner product. So 